Hello, welcome everybody to the National Constitution Center's online classroom. It is fantastic to have you all today. Just so we all know, today is Friday, and that means Fun Day Fridays. And these programs are here for you Wednesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays. And Fridays, we like to speak with great historians about the Constitution, about American history, and get really close perspectives on how they've captured history. So for our great two panelists today, I'd like to welcome Jeffrey Rosen and Alexis Coe. Jeffrey, want to start? Well, Curry, it's great to be back with you. It's been such an exciting week teaching the First Amendment, and we're so honored to be able to talk with Alexis Coe, the author of this wonderful new biography of George Washington. Um, I've just finished it, and it's riveting. It is lively. It is uh, insightful. It's deep. So um, friends, if you want a really great introduction to the father of our country that um, gives us his career in its full dimensions, you'll have it. And you'll also have uh, a biography that is written um, cognizant of the fact that there are not a lot of women who have written about George Washington. So I'm going to just jump right in and start asking Alexis some questions about it, why she decided to write it. I'll ask her to describe the life of Washington. So together during this time, we can learn as much about uh, George Washington as possible. And then Curry's going to, I know, have some questions as well. So first of all, Alexis, welcome and congratulations on a really great book. Thank you so much. And thank you for having me. And I think this is such a wonderful thing to do during this time. It really makes the most of it. Absolutely. Well, you note that there are a lot of great biographies of George Washington written by men, uh, including Ron Chernow's famous large biography. And you call them the thigh men because they're constantly talking about George Washington's thighs, how strong he was and how big his hands were and how virile he was. But you note that, that there are fewer biographies written by women. Uh, uh, why did you decide it was important to fill that gap? And what, what do you think that writing a biography from the perspective of a woman brings to the table? Well, it's interesting. I think, um, you know, I knew that it was male dominated. That was completely clear from, you know, reading biographies and the way that I happened upon, you know, I decided that Washington would be the subject of my second book was I was um, at the time hosting a show that's on hiatus called Presidents Are People Too with Audible. And um, in order to prepare for each episode, I approached it as I would a subject when I was in grad school which was I would read three to four biographies on one person and um, usually there would be a diversity of perspectives and I would emerge with that sort of going around in my head and the authors would be in conversation and I would sort of figure out where I landed. And that didn't happen with Washington biographies. Every single time I got to the end, I thought this is strange. It's like they all sort of took an oath and said like, I'm going to write a biography, I'm going to proceed in the exact same manner. Um, and it just, what they did was their stated claim, which was incredible. It's, it's my claim too. I mean, it's, it's my goal, which is to break him out of his marble mold and to create a relationship between the reader, between citizens or um, Americans or whomever who, who is interested or finds him inspiring or, or interesting or, or provocative um, or enigmatic um, and, and to get them to sort of be a little bit closer to him and see him as a fully fledged human. And that just wasn't happening because they all sort of proceeded in this same way. And halfway through the writing process, so after I already had a book deal and I was really you know, years into this, I reorganized my books and I knew it was male dominated, but I didn't realize that it was almost exclusively male. And what I'm talking about specifically is the genre of biography, not micro history. So not um, what we talk about when we talk about slavery or marriage or, or all these other approaches. I'm talking about cradle to casket, all encompassing histories. And I emailed, I was sure I was wrong. I thought, okay, I've been counting two women in some total. It must be my mistake, my limited library, my limited Googling skills, my, um, so I contacted Mount Vernon and the George Washington papers at the University of Virginia and they confirmed, I am the first woman in the last 40 years to write a biography on George Washington in that time, Chernow and, and dozens of other men. And, and we should say white men have written this history. And then if you look at the hundreds of years of Washington biographies, um, I might be the only woman historian in the last hundred years. The other two um, that I cite in the book are a journalist and a novelist. Um, and you know, so, so it's very different. And, and what we know is 
with any study, whether it's Washington, um, you know, science, anything. If you have just one type of person doing the work, meaning, um, you know, white men who tend to come from the same background, they're going to see the same thing. So that explains why there was this like, just, you know, trajectory as if they, they just dotted the lines. Um, and Annette Gordon-Reed famously showed us that in Jefferson studies, that, that when you introduce people who come from different backgrounds, who have different perspectives, they ask questions, do we know what we think we know? And they, they bring different interests and different, just a new, new set of eyes to the material. And that's what happened. Um, and then the thigh men, I didn't, you know, what, thought, what sort of struck me as strange is, again, we return to the stated goal, which is that um, Washington is too marble to be real. You know, we can't get close to him. But they would spend pages and pages talking about his body, but not, trust me, I think his body is incredible and we can get to that. <laughs> he, uses, he survived. It is amazing, but not like his legs and his thighs. And I mean, they went really all the way. Chernow says... I mean, it's the stuff of like romance novels. He talks about like rippling, you know, jaws and his, you know, muscular build. And you're like, this is a, this is something I don't, I don't know if this should be here in this biography. And so I sort of jokingly called them the thigh men because that's sort of, they had different obsessions, but that's where they all met. Amazing. Well, you do such a successful job in bringing into life this famously marble figure suddenly becomes real in your description. And what I think we should do is just run through the major periods of his life chronologically so you can tell our friends the major things that you want us to know about him. And then I know that they will have lots of questions, but let's of course begin with his relationship with his mother. You say that uh, you emphasize that he was raised by a single mother. You begin with a letter which Cherno and others uh, overinterpret to suggest that he had a fraught relationship with her. And instead, you suggest he was just impatient with her at one point in time. But tell us about his relationship with his mother, about what character traits you think he took from her and from his father who had uh, died earlier. And then you can bring us up uh, through part one to, as he struggles, as you say, to find his place in the world and makes mistakes of global consequences and becomes a colonial celebrity. So this is one of the issues that I had with the thigh men is they talk a lot about Washington's dad who died when he was, you know, 10. And they talk a lot about his half brother as if he was sort of co-parenting. But in fact, we should talk about Washington the way we do, um, you know, Obama, Clinton, Andrew Jackson, even Thomas Jefferson, Ford, which is that he was raised by a single mother. And it's a missed opportunity opportunity because it's not only the story that um, has become increasingly relatable over the years. Um, and, you know, we have this idea that, that you have to have a certain background, a certain type of education and family to become president. And where we see our first was definitely not from that. Uh, it also is a great American story that has just com be been completely missed because Washington's mother, Mary, was born to an indentured servant. And then through generations, you know, through Mary and, and her mother who worked, you know, to free herself and then married well, and then Mary married well. And then she had Washington who became president. That's an inspirational story. Um, but, you know, it's very hard to be a single mother now. We know that. And it was nearly impossible to support Washington, who was the eldest of several children in early America. And so the challenges that she faced shaped Washington. He was the head of the household. And he at times, you know, didn't, he couldn't go to school and that followed him for the rest of his life. He had to drop out when he was 14. And he would talk about that and his deficient education next to, um, you know, Jefferson who went to William and Mary and Adams who went to Harvard. He was really self-conscious of it. And also he couldn't go visit Lawrence, his half brother, his um, most advantageous relation because he couldn't afford to feed his horse. Um, but they all give Mary this really strange bad rap. And I think it's because they weren't interested in motherhood in early America, you know, she's, she has a lot in common with Abigail Adams in which they're not talking about, you know, how much they like love and appreciate and, um, you know, approve and are so proud of their sons. It wasn't the way, you know, um, Abigail Adams says to John Quincy Adams that he is the swan among a bunch of geese, her other children. So it's 
a little bit harsh if we're going to judge them in this way. And then she says, um, you know, I, where much is given, like I'm devoting resources to you, I expect a whole lot in return. So this was the way things went, because this was all about survival during this time. Diseases, um, you know, life expectancy was short, resources were scarce. Um, and so what I see with Mary is that she's not given enough credit. She really shaped him. And then there's sort of this quoting, this is a good lesson for students of all ages because historians have made this mistake in biographies. They quote secondary sources um, when it's something they're not like, let's say totally interested in. And you absolutely have to do the work because someone will catch you. And one of the most important things was they kept saying that Mary had asked the Virginia assembly for money. And in fact, she hadn't. She like every other elderly person had been worried about her safety, about her comfort during the war, which went on for many years, and came to Virginia, came close to her home. Benedict Arnold sent Jefferson running to Monticello because he took over the Capitol. And that was where she she lived in Virginia. And of course, she was like a target. She would have been a great catch for the British. Um, and, you know, they were offering pensions. So they said, hey, Washington, no worries. We're going to take care of your mother. And he was so embarrassed. He didn't write to her to check on her. He wrote to the Virginia Assembly, to Harrison, part of this forgotten presidential legacy, another dynasty like the Bushes. Um, and, and, you know, he said, she's fine, she's fine. And then after her death, a letter they never quote is one in which Washington said, oh, you know what? I looked over her ledgers and her manager was terrible. She actually really was uncomfortable. And that was my mistake. So it's really, you know, it's important to never take anything for granted when we're doing research and always look at the primary sources with the founders online that the Library of Congress and the University of Virginia and many other wonderful um, archivists and librarians and series editors have, have bestowed on us, have given it to us. It's free, anyone can go and look at it, type in Washington, Mary, type in dog, type in mule and like have a lot of fun. That's such an important um, uh, recommendation to our friends who are watching. After this conversation, do go online, go to the Founders Library, just as Alexis suggested, and uh, explore some aspect of Washington's um, character for yourself. Alexis, what was the most surprising thing you found in the primary sources about George Washington? You know, I'm asked this a lot and it changes all the time because you have to imagine that the amount of um, letters by Washington to Josh Washington and about Washington, I've read have been, you know, hundreds. Um, I think I was really struck by, um, again, the thigh men focus a lot on masculinity. It's really important to them. Um, and one of the things that's sort of tied up into this concept is uh, biological children. Washington didn't have any, and they spend a lot of time talking about why that may be. I don't, I mean, it seems obvious he had smallpox. It was very beneficial to him that he had that later. And in early America, a lot of people had um, children who were not biologically theirs. Many of the founders, uh, Madison, um, Dolly Madison came with a son and it was great news for them because it meant that their bride could have more children. And if she didn't, they had children. Everybody wins. And Washington um, met Martha when Jackie was four and Patsy was two and he raised them like his own. And I was really surprised at how effortful he was with them. He was involved in the tiniest, um, you know, details of their education, of their happiness. Um, he, he was always ordering things for Patsy that he thought might delight her. And when Patsy, who suffers from epilepsy, dies, he... It, it's so funny because everyone talks about he doesn't show his emotions. You know, they always cite um, Newberg and when he takes off his glasses and shows the soldiers that he too has suffered. And I think this letter is devastating. He's suffering. This tells you what he was like as a father. And then he continues to raise children pretty much from his late 20s until the day he dies. Jackie grows up to be a ne'er-do-well son, has a couple of his own. And, ja and Was the Washingtons raise his children because he dies um, shortly after Yorktown. And he raises nephews and nieces and friends' children. Lafayette's son comes around for a couple of years. He offers to pay for his education at Harvard. So like, this is a man who's running a, a war that's 
totally unlikely. He's the president. He is then retired. He's running a plantation of forced labor camp. And he's also wondering why Washi, his, um, his namesake, Jackie's son, cannot keep track of his umbrella, why he keeps losing them. And that's really like, I think all of it is just so surprising and it shows this incredible side of him. And while you respond and ask a question, I'm gonna make sure that my phone is plugged in. Oh, that's an excellent idea. Um, well, it is important to show the human side of Washington, especially because as you say, he devoted so much time to suppressing the expression of his emotions, to embodying those stoic ideals of self mastery and abandoning passion. But as you, revealed to us, he was able to express that in the context of his home and family. All right, I think I think we should keep yes. moving up his uh, through his biography. And we've we can you've taken him up through the uh, French and Indian War, where he makes a catastrophic blunder, uh, which nearly derails his career. Uh, tell us about uh, that, how he settles down to uh, meet uh, Martha, um, and then take us into part two, where you explore what you call the war he fought without arms, his diplomatic propaganda and espionage campaigns, which greatly contributed to the improbable American victory. There, there are a few wars I wish we spent a little bit more time on. Um, I think the Civil War and the Revolution obviously are, are um, very important in our history, but they had wars that came before them. With the Civil War, you have the Mexican-American War. With the Revolution, you have the Seven Years' War as it was known abroad and in America, the French and Indian War. And it sort of is devastating that a lot of people don't know about it. Um, it's particularly important for Washington's trajectory and his life because he, I mean, look, if they had just given him the promotions that he wanted, the British um, army, the crown, I don't, I think we would be British citizens. I'm not quite sure our subjects rather. Um, Washington wanted to get ahead. Every president is ambitious. That's just true from Carter, you know, you name it, their ambition is integral to their trajectory, but it looks different in um, everyone's life. And for Washington, because he came from this like deprivation, you know, but had half siblings who had advantages, he was surrounded by Virginia planters, he wanted to get ahead. And how do you get ahead in the new world but to join the military? And there were different ways that he would do this, but the best and easiest way was to join the Virginia militia. And he was sent out into the wilds of the Ohio, at first on a diplomatic mission, um, but through miscommunication, bad translations, old enemies, the half king, and the French, he basically ends up overseeing the assassination of a French diplomat. But this is what this is like Washington. The reason I, I love this story, it's a little bit strange to love this story, this assassination, but the reason I love it is it shows who Washington was. And then we look at who he became over time when he became president by the time he reached what would you know be the first president. Um, residency of the president in, in New York and then Philadelphia. So what happens is he writes to his boss to tell him this, Dinwiddie, but he spends the first three pages complaining about his pay. He's not happy. He wants a promotion. He wants, you know, to be equal to a British soldier. He's worked hard. He suffered. He's, um, you know, left his own uh, businesses behind, which his mother did not think was a good idea. So she was actually right in the end. Um, and then he gets to page three and he's like, by the way, <laughs> this uh, Juman Vieux uh, has died and um, it's, it's their fault. It's definitely their fault. What happens though, is that Dinwiddie needs to sort of like get, um, you know, the British to support this international incident that has just launched a war. And so he has um, the journal published that Washington sent him along with the letter and which he turned in when he went back to Alexandria. And Washington becomes completely famous, both in the colonies and abroad. And what's wonderful about that is he becomes, um, on the, he, he lands on the radar of a very promising young widow named Martha Custis at the time. And he gets dysentery, has to go see a doctor and that's how he met her. So like a great love story that started with a, you know, terrible gastrointestinal, uh, you know, situation. Wow. 
Um, and uh, that notion that it really was a catastrophe that the French diplomat had come over to sue for peace and, and Washington completely misunderstanding things, uh, exercise this brutal assassination was such a bracing reminder that, that even this great uh, figure started off uh, with something that could have derailed his career. Um, Absolutely. And so that's the thing he would learn later to control himself. And what's really interesting is during the revolution, not to skip ahead. I love this. I love going through his life. Yeah. But during the revolution, you know, we we think of Benedict Arnold as, um, you know, an American traitor. We, you know, children on a schoolyard sort of call each other. This is an insult. Everyone knows that Benedict Arnold, but that's not how he started. He started out as one of the great war heroes and as one of, um, you know, he was almost most similar to Washington, but the different, and they came from similar backgrounds, but Washington by that point had learned to bite his tongue uh -huh. and he, you know, and he had learned to sort of channel his complaints in a non-emotional way, in a non-personal way to make it about the collective. Whereas Arnold, struggled with this and you see that happening and, and eventually he becomes so embittered. Washington learned to get rid of some of that bitterness. Uh, you know, he was helped by marrying Martha who had a lot of money, but let's let's move uh -huh. on from, yes. Well, but let me ask you how he managed, how he learned to master his emotions. You note that uh, one of his favorite plays was Addison's Cato, which he famously mm -hmm. had performed at Valley Forge. Cato, the Roman hero who is a famous Stoic, who is always mastering his emotions to achieve tranquility. And Washington, the famous story, which everyone tells, taking off his glasses uh, to show that he'd grown blind in the service of his country, just as the character in Cato did. But what were the factors uh, that led Washington to learn to master his emotions? And how did he demonstrate that self-mastery during the Revolutionary War? Well, it's interesting, you know, you can't really pinpoint it, but the, it's a clear evolution when you look at it on a whole. He, um, you know, he, he quits, he, his retirement plan is Martha. He marries her and she comes with this great estate and, um, you know, hundreds of enslaved people and children and um, he is suddenly catapulted. He is among the Virginia elite. He's, and he's also the most famous of all the colonists. And so he's suddenly satisfied. He's really, um, you know, he's still ambitious. He still wants to be a part of the larger community. He's a businessman, certainly first and foremost. He's very concerned with maximizing profits at Mount Vernon, but he um, starts to run for different offices. He holds positions at churches. He becomes um, the executor of wills of other esteemed people in Virginia. And through that, he forms, you know, he gets a sense of service and he's no longer just doing it to get ahead. He's, he doesn't need to. He can just be at home with his family and be working on his business and, and still be huge in, in, you know, the colonies at the time. But he wants to be at the center of his country's story and the name of that country changes through his life. And by the time he goes, um, you know, to Philadelphia to meet for the first, you know, well, the second time with, with colonists from all over um, America. So he's no longer just sitting with the Virginia Assembly or, you know, either in their proper meeting place or in a tavern because, you know, the Virginia governor, the royal governor has just, you know, banded them for, for talking back to the crown and to parliament. Um, by the time he shows up and he's in a uniform ready to fight, he is, doing this on a voluntary basis. He wants it for himself. It'll help him in business, but he is confident. Um, and he, he just isn't as he's, he's still hungry, but he isn't, um, he knows he can go home with his head high and he's accomplished a lot. Everything at this point is icing on the cake. And it's crazy to say that at this point, because we're about to launch into the revolutionary war, but it is, and he has people's esteem. People struggled to describe Washington and the power he held over others. And by this point he had figured it out and it's really just a word charisma. And he had it. It's hard to describe. It's mm -hmm. impossible to cultivate you. Um, you know, we, we, someone we meet at a party we can't really we can't really describe why they're charismatic and it was the same with Washington he also by this point you know has a lot of 
jaw issues because of his dentures. He has terrible teeth, famously not wooden. We can get to that later. Um, but it causes him to not only be self-conscious, but it, it's difficult depending on the set that he's wearing to speak. And, and, and so it makes him also, it gives him a moment to think before he talks. And that's a great lesson that we're all always trying to learn. I remember um, a professor told me when I started teaching, talk slowly and think fast. <laughs> that's magnificent. I have had the honor of interviewing Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg and she has long pauses between uh, the questions and answers, almost unnaturally so. And I asked her why and she said, long ago I learned to think before I speak. And yes. your great insight that for Washington, it may have been a dental problem that led to this yeah. brilliant insight is really interesting. Well, tell us more about the dentures. Oh, that's so funny. Um, I, she married me and she had this oh. pause before she said that. And I was like nervous she didn't approve or something. Well, Alexis, but it was just that she does this. She married me as well. So we share that oh, in common. Yes. Wonderful. It's, a, it's yes. a great honor. And as you know, you really have to wait, but it's always worth the wait because what she said is. is so spectacularly it happens at, thought out thought out yes and it happens yeah. at the most i don't know if yours happened at the most romantic time one o'clock on a monday but mm -hmm. that's when uh that's when we did it but um yeah so it was great so i don't i don't you know washington also um because he felt as if he was born with all his privilege and it was taken away from him that he studied people around him constantly um, and, and there's all this debate about the rules of civility, this book on decorum that he, you know, copied all the, um, the, the rules out, the lessons. And historians sort of disagree why he did so. My theory is that um, if you look at Washington, a blessing to anyone who wants to read his letters, even though Founders Online has gloriously transcribed them and annotated them for you. So it's just like everything is there for you for the taking, enjoy yourselves. Um, but he, he copied them, I think, in, in part to just improve his penmanship, which again was gorgeous. Um, but, you know, he, he threw that through like sort of trying to supplement his education. He knew that that lettered men had nice writing. I think he those lessons sunk in and he began to practice them when again, he became comfortable with himself, with his financial situation, when he felt that he had the respect of his peers who had had advantages that he had not had. Um, and I think that was a big part of it. And just studying everyone around him. He was really one of these people who, um, he has an ego, certainly. I mean, I think that it would be impossible for someone who had achieved what he did not to, but he, it, it was not detectable in this way. Um, he didn't indulge himself. He didn't like flattery one bit. Wow. Um, there are all sorts of great questions. As we're speaking, Clark uh, Willis asks, what does charisma mean? Which is an excellent question. And oh, I'm just yes. looking, I'm just looking at the, di the, the dictionary, which says there are two definitions, Clark. One, compelling attractiveness or charm that can inspire uh -huh. devotion in others. But the second is a divinely conferred power or talent. Uh, Alexis, which of those two definitions do you think better suited Washington? Well, here's the thing. It's really interesting. That's such a good question. And, and it is um, something that I think we always do. So I love that you immediately went to the dictionary instead of sort of thinking, well, charisma. Um, mm -hmm. I think we all need to constantly look, again, look at sources. Isn't that always the answer? Yes. I would lean towards the first definition because divine strikes me. Um, well, it's interesting. I mean, it's probably a blend, but I would lean towards the first. I think that... Um, Charisma is, uh, you know, we often see it in in celebrities. Is probably another way to to define it um, or to give you know examples of it. We see it in athletes, you know, when they're really graceful, they have a presence. Charisma, another word for it, is presence. Um, but it's really not something you can cultivate. It's something that is natural, but but can. You know, I would, as I'm saying that, I'm sort of rethinking it, um, that, you know, he was certainly born with it, that the, the sort of taking a moment to think gave him, um, you know, something that, that puts people, it, it makes them wait for what you're saying. And that is a useful tool. Um, he was tall. He had a presence. Jefferson was also tall, but, you know, Washington had a build. And later, the funny thing about um, the Thymans' obsession with his physique <laughs> is if you look at the paintings over time, um, 
you know, like, like all of us with age, it becomes a little bit harder to stay in shape. He became more sedentary. He has um, a little bit of a thin, you know, his hips are a little bit narrow and then his, his midsection grows with age. Um, but he has this like presence that, that people definitely respect. And he was graceful. That's important to note. They talk about manliness and masculinity, but he, he was a wonderful dancer. And he clearly moved in a way that people, um, you know, took notice. Wow, wonderful. And Clark also asked, uh, does penmanship mean handwriting? Clark, it does. And Clark, thank you for asking. If you don't know what a word means, never be embarrassed to ask. If you don't know what any of us, anything means, it's always important to ask so that we can clarify and we can all learn together. So thank you for that. So Alexis, it's I guess we're up. Yes. Yes, well, exactly. That's that a think, good way to put it. Yeah, yes. it's smart to ask yes. because we we don't there. I there's no stupid question. Um, you should always ask the most obvious question because you may have missed something, and if you miss something, there's a good chance someone else missed something too. Which is again how I came to write this book is I checked the sources and what the biographers were saying did not match up with what I was seeing in the archives. So like, thank you so much for reminding us all of this really important lesson. Thank you. Yes, thank you indeed. Um, you don't spend a huge amount of time at the, with Washington at the Constitutional Convention, because, and that makes sense, because he didn't say much there, and it was not I'm a sorry. central yes. public presence. No, no, but it is the National <laughs> Constitution Center, so I have I know, to ask I know. you <laughs> what his contribution to the Constitutional Convention was, and then take us up through his presidency, because after all, the convention had his presidency preordained, and if people had, weren't confident that he was going to be the first president, they wouldn't have agreed to create the presidency that they did. I think it's so important to remember that Washington, um, you know, the presidency was was really crafted with him in mind. The 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 first, and this is a lesson for the ages, and this is a lesson that can be applied to Washington and any situation that we're currently dealing with. Um, you know, they they weren't all knowing. They expected the country to evolve and the needs of the nation to evolve and um, the government to respond to that. And the presidency, you know, they figured out quite a lot about it, but they didn't figure out everything. And they thought that's okay, because here's Washington who has given up power after the war. He quite famously, you know, gave over his sword in Annapolis and, um, got home in time for Christmas, that was something that ha was totally unheard of. We live in an age of democracies. And so we um, think that's the norm. Washington was born in the age of monarchs and he rebelled. He led a rebellion. He was a totally unlikely you know, rebel. All of these guys were, they were businessmen. Um, they were, you know, you didn't expect them to leave all of that and, and endanger it and take up arms. They would have been severely punished if they had been lost, probably um, with death, and yet uh, they did. So it's really, it, that within itself is just amazing. So Washington has proven himself that he can be trusted with power. And so they basically say, okay, you know, he's definitely going to be president. And so we'll leave him to figure a lot out. He goes home and he's, you know, I believe him this time. I don't believe him when he shows up in 1775 in Philadelphia in his uniform that he hasn't worn in a long time. He's really like stuffed up into it. And he's, you know, he's there to, to he's running for general before, you know, he hears it. Now I believe him. I think he wanted to go home. I think he had to deal with Martha that they would stay home. He would no longer make her travel. She hated to travel. And they loved, you know, Mount Vernon. They had a a pretty good setup for them there, not so much for the enslaved people who made it so nice for them, but they had a nice setup. So Washington goes home and he's like, I'm not gonna be president. I did what I needed to do. I oversaw the constitutional convention. I gave them my thoughts. And sometimes just by sitting there in this you know, chair that was elevated, that's great to see in person. Um, and everyone goes on this campaign. They write him letters. Madison, um, who's not married yet, uh, he'll need the Washington's help for that later. He's not good with women. And, you know, Madison skips out on his own family's Christmas to go spend it at Mount Vernon, convincing him to be president. Finally, he gives in, 
but even he's not totally sure, even though he was there and he's obviously been in correspondence with, with Jefferson, with Madison, he's not totally sure what the president is going to do either. So he gets the constitution and he literally writes. So again, not only should you ask questions, but like annotate or take notes nothing this is how basic even our 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 first our you know the, the hero of the revolution was he wrote president he wrote president next to things he thought he could do and things that he couldn't and he checked in constantly about it the most basic thing and no one was sure how to do anything he showed up for the first time after being you know finally giving in to being president he sh and which he compared by the way to going to his execution so he really, really wasn't thrilled. He sh he had everything to lose. He was the most famous guy in the world. He had, you know, and and he was spoiler. He was right. So he shows up, um, and he doesn't even know he has a question. He's used to a council from um, the Revolutionary War, which includes a lot of people who he surrounds himself with, um, you know, during the presidency, like a guy named Alexander Hamilton, little known in America, and he um, he goes to Congress and he asks them, he submits questions in advance. This is the first time this is happening, very exciting. They're all excited to see him, but they don't know how to react. He's following the constitution, which says, bring your questions to Congress. Um, he brings Henry Knox, who is uh, you know, the secretary of war. And he's, he's in charge of this, this big question about Indians and what to do in this conflict between settlers. And um, Congress doesn't, have an answer even though they got the questions they don't have an answer they have no questions to ask Knox and um they just disliked him and Washington you know we talked about his temper earlier this is an example of he usually manages to keep it around this time he totally loses it he storms out and he's like why did I even come here and he never does it again Okay, I'm gonna to have to check on the charger again. You ask your next question. Okay, I will. Um, it's, uh, the next question is uh, from um, one of our uh, great questioners and it's how different would the presidency be uh, if instead of Washington, the first to hold the office uh, and set the stage for future presidents would have been Hamilton, Monroe or Trump. And I'll just uh, gloss that by saying, what were the distinctive contributions that Washington made to the presidency uh, traditions that he established that are not explicit in that constitution where he wrote his handwritten annotations, which we had the thrill of displaying at the Constitution Center lent from Mount Vernon, where I know you've seen it. It's, it's amazing to see those annotations in this beautiful country. Yes. But, but what, how, the, the question is, how did Washington transform the presidency and what were his distinctive contributions to the office? I mean, there was no presidency. So he completely transformed it by um, setting the precedent. So the creation of the cabinet, that is um, an enduring institution. He, you know, sort of picking up where I left off with the last answer, he was dissatisfied, shall we say, with um, Congress. He needed answers. He needed debate. He needed to figure out kind of in real time if he could, um, you know, by watching great minds discuss something because a good president, a good president listens and a good president surrounds himself, we know this, uh, with good thinkers who care about the country. And um, so what Washington did was he decided, okay, I'm gonna send the questions, I'm gonna try to do this council with Hamilton, Jefferson, Madison, who was not in the cabinet, who was an elected official at the time, but um, at first, he you know, would still write to Madison, but he was not a part of the core, Randolph. Um, and he uh, then decided that took too long. He would have to like send questions back. He would get their answers. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't an efficient process. So he moves to Philadelphia um, after the great compromise uh, between the, um, between, you know, we don't know what happened, but we do know there was a dinner between Hamilton, Jefferson and Madison. And at the end, uh, you know, Hamilton got his bank and Jefferson and Madison got their Southern location, which was news for Washington too, because it meant that they were closer to Mount Vernon and that they would return to Philadelphia, which they liked a lot better than New York. They did not care for New York at all. Um, so he gets them all in a room and uh, he lets them fight it out. And I don't just say that as like, oh, it's a way of explaining it. Their letters about these cabinet meetings are brutal. 
the terms that they use are truly, um, so at one point Jefferson years later describes what it was like to be in fights constantly with Hamilton. They were fundamentally different um, and would, you know, uh, they would, they would basically, um, the, it would be the, the birth of political parties by names that we no longer use, Federalists and um, Democratic Republicans. But, but what Washington had set out to do was not have parties by having all these people around backfired. But Jefferson describes these arguments, these conflicts as cockfights. So that is when we have cocks, which is illegal in America, when we have them fighting each other to the death. And that means that Jefferson and Hamilton, they have these like razor beaks and they're fighting each other with like people around them, cheering them on in a like, you know, kind of in a, you know, there's a reason it's illegal. And Washington is just presiding over them, watching this bloodbath and saying like, yes, fight it out. Um, and Washington almost always sided with Hamilton, not because he was a favorite though he was, um, but because he, fundamentally had this worldview that's um, opposed to what we associate with the Republican Party of today, which is a strong central government. Washington and Hamilton believed in a strong central government, whereas Jefferson and Madison um, didn't. And that's really, it's an important distinction. So the cabinet is, I would say, the most specific precedent um, you know, from the beginning of the presidency, although it took a while, it was, it came about in the first term, but it was an evolution. Um, we're not quite sure why he called it that. It, there's a name Cabinetto, um, the Italians had a version, but basically the cabinet. Um, and then if I fast forward to the end of his presidency, two terms, Washington set that precedent. It wasn't in the constitution, um, either was the cabinet. And he decided that he had had enough. He wanted to go home, didn't want to deal with anyone anymore. Wow. Um, well, uh, I have lots more questions, but we're almost out of time. And Curry Sautner, my phenomenal colleague, our chief learning officer, um, has uh, is going to ask our final question. So take it away, Curry. Sure, and we like to always refer to this as a speed round. So I'm going to try to shove in like five questions from the students that are online. And really, yes. the, the questions all wrap around uh, Washington and enslaving other humans yes. and Oni Judge, his pursuit of Oni Judge. So the the big question is really how how do we reconcile people in history that we put as heroes, but then can find out some devastating things about them too and turn them into villains in our head as well? How do we reconcile those stories? Could you speak more of just Washington and enslavement? And then the second set of question is. How, from Cassidy, I thought this was a great question she put in earlier. What's the saddest thing you have found in your research as well? So a lot of people wanna know how you reconcile it. How do we yeah. as people reconcile it and tell us more about those stories in Washington? Well, th they're one and the same. The answer is this is the saddest thing to me. Um, look, when I think of Washington, I think, um, I don't think of him as my personal role model. I think that's a that's a choice, and I'm this is what I do as a, a profession. So I don't even think it's like appropriate for me to say, but I do think that it's really important to understand that that that's a personal decision to to declare someone in history your role model. The reason we know Washington is he is historically significant, and you can and this is how I reconcile these things: his greatness and his. Um, his horrific acts, which is that in order to understand our country, you need to understand Washington. Everything about what we see um, in the White House happening, when we see um, divisiveness div in the country, um, when we saw uh, Charlottesville, when we see um, inequity, all of this comes back to Washington and situations that he dealt with either well or poorly, um, not just from a from our perspective now in 2020, but at the time. So something that's that is um, hard for me is when people say that Washington made the bold act to emancipate his slaves in his will outright. And they use outright. And that's just not accurate if we look at the dictionary. The dictionary 
um, says that outright is right away and uh, without any um, conditions, right? So we, again, it's something that I, again, coming back to this great question, I, I went back and I just looked at the dictionary. He did free one man outright, Billy Lee, who he had always thought of as exceptional, what we would call today as a token, right? That, that there's a token person who you think um, is, is you have around you and everyone talked about Billy Lee. And that is often by the thigh men been misinterpreted as um, Washington's sort of view of the enslaved people as a whole. He um, struggled with this question to varying degrees over time, but not really until the revolution when he was surrounded by Europeans who came and helped us win, like the Marquis de Lafayette made famous from Hamilton and um, famous before, but you know, made famous in our popular, popular collective memory. Um, and how, you know, Lafayette wrote to him for decades, proposing different plans. He said, look, I'll, I'll go have these with you on um, some land and you can have, instead of paying or complicating the structure of fully emancipating your enslaved people, because Washington said he wants the government to do it, he wants it to be so gradual, these are his words, that it's imperceptible, that's disappointing. Um, you know, and he says, I'll go have these with you, we can give them this farm, it's our little experiment. And Washington goes, you're so kind, that says so much about you as a person, let's talk when you're here. Meanwhile, when you're here means like in 10 years because it takes a long time to plan these trips and to get over. He never does it. He is aware. We can't just say he's a man of his time. He's aware there are other examples in Virginia. If Washington had emancipated his slaves, I don't know if that would have changed the country. I don't know if the Civil War would have happened sooner. I don't know if we would be a country, but I do know it would have been huge. Um, Washington instead freed William Lee outright, and then um, the rest of his enslaved population, who were over 100 people, would be freed either upon Martha's death or his or her discretion. I'm not sure she knew about this. He asked her to bring two very dramatically deathbed, um, you know, decision. He he asked her to bring two wills the night that he died, which was a whole different story. And he burned one, the one that had been prepared by a lawyer, the one that he had written him. Just a couple of months earlier, he died in December, he wrote that over the summer, um, that said that he would emancipate them. And I don't know if she knew, but she certainly the day after, as did all the enslaved people, because his will was published, because it was, while it was this, um, you know, very meaningful thing that happened to these enslaved people, it was also about legacy to a certain extent. And um, Martha, we know from letters from, again, Abigail Adams and other people, spent the next year of her life in fear that these people saw her rightfully as um, the thing standing between them and their freedom. And so she was worried they were gonna burn down her house. She was worried they were going to murder her. And so she emancipates them, but not her own slaves, which would be inherited by her children who I mentioned before, but they did own enslaved people between them and she decided not to. And her letters show us that she was never going to. Um, so that's you know a very, very quick snapshot of Washington slavery. Mary V. Thompson, who is the foremost uh, Washington scholar who's at Mount Vernon, wrote um, a book called uh, The Only Unavoidable Subject of Regret. It has everything in it is the definitive book on Washington slavery. We differ somewhat on where we come out on him, um, but I think that that is a wonderful book. And, and in it, and also in my book, you know, we talk about Washington, while he could treat Billy Lee quite well, um, you know, he, he, he physically assaulted slaves too. And, and, and we have to understand that, um, that he believed in democracy and freedom for certain people and not others. And Ona Judge, Erica Dunbar, um, an incredible historian and friend wrote a book called Never Caught. And there's a adult version and also a young reader's version. It is a wonderful book that reads like a novel and I encourage you to read it. And um, there's another man named Hercules who shows up in my book. Ona Judge was not the only person in Philadelphia who got a taste of freedom to very quickly go through that story. Um, in Philadelphia, if you, if you were enslaved and you were there for more than six months, you were owed your freedom. And Washington knew this and he very openly discussed it with Tobias Lear, his secretary, who would later marry into the family and said, you know, you need to rotate them right before the six month mark. And if you think that they know this, you need to send them home to Mount Vernon because he didn't want uh, a lot of those enslaved people, you know, belong to the Custis estate to Martha and he didn't want to have to pay the estate for them. So it really was a dollar and cents thing to Washington. 
um, it's incredibly disappointing. But then again, as they said, we have to hold these two things at once or else we'll never understand our country. And I believe that my readers don't need a heroic story, that they will find whatever it is that they want in it. They just need the truth and they need the facts. I think that's fantastic. Thank you. I wanted to get in that question. And all listeners, I will make sure that it will email you all the awesome books that she just went through. Okay. They're great reads. Um, I also, for our younger listeners, you can get this book on Bookshare and Audible. And so if the language in some of these books may be too high of a level for you, listen to the book. It's a great way to read a higher level. So thank you so much, Jeff, turning it back to you. And I love the idea of holding the whole person in different parts in your our understanding to really understand American history. So back to you, Jeff. Just a uh, uh, sincere thank you to everyone who joined this Friday. Please come back next week. We're going to talk about the Fourth Amendment to the Constitution, the protections against unreasonable searches and seizures at 1 p.m. on Wednesdays and Thursdays, and it'll be great to see you then. But mostly, thank you so much, Alexis Coe, for a truly illuminating, uh, I think I'll say, uh, groundbreaking look at Washington, which helps us to see the father of our country in a new and clarifying light. So for spreading so much constitutional light and wisdom and for exciting all of us to learn more about history, thank you, Alexis Coe. Thank you, this was wonderful. Thank great. you so Thanks, much. Thanks everyone. Bye, have a great weekend. Bye. Thank you. Bye.